we are going to talk about uh, Sri Lanka. So I don't know if you guys are following the news and watching the news, um, but uh, you know this this is I think making headlines everywhere. At least uh, those news outlets that cover um, cover the uh, cover uh, world affairs. Uh, Sri Lanka is basically uh, you know in a in a state of collapse. Uh, yesterday on Saturday. The uh, presidential palace and the office and home of the prime minister were all occupied by protest protesters. I think the home of the prime minister was set on fire. Uh, this is after months and months of demonstrations. This is after people uh, all over. Oh, Ocon discount expires tomorrow, Shazbot says. So uh, sign up today. Is there, is there like a link where people can sign up? Um, uh, to uh, to do that, but but yes, Ocon discount expires tomorrow. Shazbot was at Ocon. He was at, I think, both of my uh, my shows uh, from Ocon, or just one of them. I can't remember, uh, but that was great. All right. So anyway, um, uh, Sri Lanka falling apart, as I said. Demonstrations since uh, March. Food prices going up through the roof. Uh, not just inflation at above thirty percent. But inflation of food uh, dramatically higher than um, uh, than thirty percent, uh, and we'll get to why. Uh, but it's not just prices going up; uh, massive shortages uh, of of st food staples like rice. Uh, Sri Lanka, a huge rice producer, and there are shortages of rice. As I said, we will get to why that is in a few minutes. Uh, you've got uh, uh, fuel. People lining up long lines for months now to get uh, to get gasoline to be able to drive. Uh, the country in June last month defaulted on some foreign debt. It says like fifty billion dollars of foreign debt. Uh, about uh, fifteen percent of that is to China, but the rest is to Japan and to a lot of private uh, investors, a lot of private um, uh, bondholders. Uh, the country is uh, decimated. It's 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 worse than I think the Greek crisis was in 2011. In the, not in the sense of its maybe global implications. Greece is at the heart of Europe and part of the European Union, and it had implications for all of Europe, particularly for Germany. And on the upside for Greece, there was an obvious uh, uh, there was an obvious partner for a bailout, which was Germany and uh, and the rest of Europe. Here, uh, who's going to bail these guys out? And it's much worse. There's literally starvation. I think I read somewhere 80 to 90 percent of Sri Lankans are skipping a meal, uh, you know, which I guess these days is considered healthy uh, to skip, uh, uh, skipping breakfast in particular. Um, you know, and, and so Sri Lanka is in free fall. The, the economy is in free fall. Uh, the president and the prime minister given that their residencies are being occupied, have resigned. And um, uh, so they're, they're going to form some kind of unity government. That unity government is going to try to negotiate with the IMF to try to get a deal uh, for a bailout. But such a, such a bailout will require massive changes and a dramatic, dramatic reduction in um, standard of living, quality of life, uh, I think for a long time in Sri Lanka as it pays off its debts and restructures its economy. So what happened? Just a few years ago, in 2018-19, Sri Lanka was considered uh, one of the strongest economies in the world. I'd say pre-19, so maybe 16, 17, 18. It, were, it, it had grown, was growing at, at very high rates of growth. It was considered a middle to high-income country. It had a GDP per capita, I think, that's double, at least double that of India. Uh, it was an economy on the rise. It was being praised uh, for its success. And we can talk, we'll talk about why it, 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 it had done so well, uh, what had led to that. But, um, but today, you know, three years later, it is basically a disaster, a starvation, and um, and complete political collapse. What happened? 
So to understand kind of what's happened, um, I want to go back, uh, give you a little bit of history. I know some of you at least like the history stuff. A little bit of history. It's modern history, so it's not, uh, I don't know, um, I don't know Sri Lankan history, so I only know kind of its modern history. But we have to go back to the late 1970s, early 1980s, um, and, and the, the launch of a, of a, a, a terrorist campaign, a, a, a civil war, you could call it, within Sri Lanka that started. Uh, there are basically two uh, main ethnic groups in, um, in Sri Lanka, the majority and then the Tamils. Um, both are variations, I think, of Buddhism. Uh, but uh, the Tamils were a minority and, and felt they, like, and I assume this is true, that they were discriminated against uh, and did not have opportunities and did not have any political say. And as a consequence, they launched, in a sense, a civil war and a terrorist campaign, <clears throat> maybe to try to establish independence or at least to try to establish some say in the politics and the economic life of Sri Lanka. And I don't know why I'm saying Sri Lanka. It's really Sri Lanka. S-R-I, Sri Lanka. Um, this war, which was quite devastating, and uh, I've seen estimates in the tens of thousands of deaths uh, as a consequence of this uh, war, uh, it lasted 30 years uh, until 2009. In 2009, uh, two brothers, uh, the president at the time, uh, his name was Mahinda Rajapaksa, Rajapaksa. Paksa, and I apologize if I am slaughtering the name Raja Paksa. Of course, Sri Lanka was a uh, was a um, uh, uh, a British colony by the name of Ceylon, C E Y L O N, um, and uh, you know uh, it changed its name when it gained its independence. Anyway, there was a, a, the president was Mahinda Raja Paksa, um, and his brother got. Tabaya Rajapaksa was the defense secretary. They basically launched a brutal, um, unyielding campaign against the Tamils. They did what you need to do in order to destroy an insurgency. They did what you need to do in order to uh, uh, des destroy uh, terrorist activity. Um, they were brutal, uh, but they were incredibly efficient, and they brought, basically brought the Tamils to the heels in 2009, the Tamil Tigers uh, basically were destroyed, capitulated, and the Civil War was over. Uh, both brothers became obviously heroes after uh, uh, stopping uh, this 30-year war. Uh, you know, I don't know if you know this, but I think it's the Tamil Tigers who really made, I don't know if they invented it in modern terms, but they certainly made popular in uh, modern, in the modern world, the idea of suicide bombers. So the Tamils were the first, I think, uh, based on my readings, the first suicide bombers in, um, in, modern, um, in modern annals of terrorism. The Muslims learned it from them. So 2009, um, you know, Mahinda uh, was president, his brother was defense secretary, and they became heroes. And indeed, from that point on, the uh, Rajapaksa family came to dominate uh, Sri Lanka politics. Uh, uh, Mahinda served uh, two terms as president. Um, after he left the presidency, his brother, Gotabaya, became president. And indeed, Gotabaya was president uh, until yesterday when he resigned. In the meantime, Mahinda went from being president to being prime minister. So they controlled both of the key positions in the, um, in the Sri Lanka government. Um, and they controlled many of the other departments. They, brought, they, had two, they have two other brothers who were ministers in the government. Uh, one of them has a son who is another minister in the government. Um, basically, uh, these guys uh, controlled right, uh, the entire political structure in Sri Lanka. And it's quite evident uh, that they um, participated in and were part of a, uh, an incredibly corrupt regime where they got incredibly rich at the expense of the Sri Lankan people. Um, they were treated as heroes because of the victory over the Tamils, and therefore were granted, I think, a wide berth in order to, in which they practiced their, uh, uh, 
uh, their corruption. Uh, you, you know, they also had uh, wide uh, control economically and so on. Anyway, from 2009 uh, until really 2020, although the economy got into some trouble in 2019, but until 2020, the economy grew at, at significant rates, uh, getting up to 6 7% growth. It was one of the fastest uh, e uh, e economies, growing economies in the world. Um, uh, generally, income uh, rose, standard of living rose, quality of life rose across, uh, across the entire uh, country uh, to the benefit of its citizens. Now, uh, two sources for this economic growth. One, peace. You know, peace uh, is, is an important component of economic growth. Peace allows one to invest. It, it eliminates uncertainty. It provides for some, if not a lot, of foreign investment. Um, so that was one. Second was, uh, was a, a dramatic increase in commodity prices, uh, commodities that, or really agricultural products that... Uh, the uh, uh, Sri Lanka was very good at producing and, uh, and, and exporting. Uh, so we saw uh, uh, prices go up of rubber. Uh, if, if you remember, well, I don't know if you remember, maybe you know this, Ceylon, um, you know, rubber was discovered in Brazil, in the Amazon. And, uh, uh, you know, uh, during the 19th century, uh, a lot of people, particularly uh, German immigrants to Brazil, became very, very wealthy. Uh, off of the rubber plantations in the Amazon. Indeed, uh, the uh, uh, Manaus, the city in the middle of the Amazon, was one of the richest cities in the world. It was one of the first cities in the world to electrify, uh, provide electricity. It built a magnificent um, opera house, uh, which still stands, a beautiful, magnificent European-style opera house that would invite opera companies into the heart of the Amazon to perform there, um, it was a it was a, one of the richest country uh, places in the world because of the immense uh, rubber plantations. During I think it was World War II, maybe before, but certainly during World War II, the British uh, the British sent a spy uh, to Brazil, and and basically they they stole. I mean I don't I guess you could call it stealing. Basically the the Brazilians protected the rubber plant uh, from, they didn't want to export the plant because they wanted to maintain kind of a monopoly over it. So uh, the British uh, stole the rubber plant and took it to the Far East, um, where it was planted in places like um, uh, Malaysia, uh, I think Indonesia, and, uh, and, and Ceylon, which in the advantage of Ceylon is I think it was never, it was never occupied by the Japanese, and the British could continue uh, to produce rubber in Ceylon. Of course, rubber required for, uh, for jeeps, for cars, for, uh, for basically for military equipment, for military, uh, for running the war. So uh, Ceylon became an important hub of rubber production in the world and uh, has exported a lot of rubber. Uh, but also uh, the other thing that Ceylon, if you've, uh, you know, if you've traveled the world, you know that Ceylon tea is incredibly valuable. Tea, and we'll get back to tea later because tea plays an important role in this economic collapse. Tea is, um, it, Ceylon tea is, is well regarded all over the world. And, um, and uh, that was another major, major um, export uh, from, um, uh, uh, from Sri Lanka. So tea and rubber, uh, were two, and those prices were going up during the early uh, uh, 20-teens, and as a consequence, the Sri Lanka economy did well. In addition to that, uh, there was some liberalization of the economy, you know, and farming was particularly productive, uh, and the economy was doing well. Uh, Sri Lankans are generally well-educated. Uh, they have supposedly a fairly good health system. Uh, life expectancy is, is longer than it is, for example, in India. Again, wealth is dramatically higher. So, uh, so all of that was true. But then add to that a massive uh, binge of debt. So the Sri Lankans uh, borrowed money like crazy. They borrowed it from anybody who would give it to them. And they uh, borrowed it and invested dramatically in infrastructure, roads, bridges, airports, and ports. 
One of the reasons Sri Lanka is important and maybe is making the news more than you'd expect is, uh, you know, FYT says socialized healthcare and education. Yes, but some socialized healthcare systems are better, some are worse. Supposedly, theirs is at the margin better uh, in, in the same education system, maybe as an inheritance for the British, um, particularly the educational system, probably as an inheritance from the British, is a, is a well functioning educational system. Again, healthcare and education, not as good as it would be in a private market, but relative to other socialized countries, supposedly pretty good. Relative to other Asian countries, supposedly pretty good. So they went on a borrowing binge. Lots of money. Lots of money, paying for lots of government employees, paying for lots of subsidies to their favorite industries, their famous farmers. Lots of money uh, flowing in. I mean, one of the beauties of infrastructure projects, construction projects, is they are rife for corruption. Uh, these are the kind of projects where politicians get suitcases full of cash to put on the side by different contractors who are bidding for projects. There are multiple ways in which you can, you can benefit from these projects. And uh, Sri Lanka uh, was building all over the place. And I, I was getting to why it's strategically important. One of the strategic, uh, uh, main strategic, uh, or not one of the, the main reason Sri Lanka is strategically important is that it sits a little south of India, southeast of India. And in that sense, it sits on the uh, main shipping channel from Europe, Africa, to East Asia. Any ship leaving uh, China or Japan or any of the Eastern Asian countries, Taiwan, South Korea, heading towards Europe, heading towards the Suez Canal and into Europe, has to pass by uh, the waters or just off the coast of Ceylon, uh, of Sri Lanka, not Ceylon, Sri Lanka. And of course, any ship traveling to Africa, although trade with Africa is not that great, has to pass through those waters. So this is a, a key strategic location, key strategic ports, um, and uh, uh, one reason why Sri Lanka became a part of the um, uh, One Road uh, Chinese initiative, uh, and uh, the Chinese lent quite a bit of money to the Sri Lankas. Uh, you know, only, it's only about 15% of total debt, but quite a bit of money. And as part of that, uh, China owns a massive port in Sri Lanka, which is part of this, uh, uh, you know, uh, back and forth of... Uh, uh, you know, which is part of this uh, one road, Silk Road, if you will, the Silk Road, the renewed Silk Road effort uh, by the Chinese. So, uh, so Sri Lanka uh, is, is strategic, it's important, it invested hugely in, um, in infrastructure. And for a while, you know, that was fine. But then, but then, Basically, I don't know, one, two, three, three things happened that started to alter the framework or alter the, the, the projection for Sri Lanka. First, well, before I, before I say that, let me just say one more thing important. Uh, one of the major sources of foreign exchange for Sri Lanka, one of the major sources of revenue, one of the major sources of employment in Sri Lanka is tourism. Tourism is a major source of revenue in Sri Lanka. It's got beautiful beaches, amazing hotels. Um, it, by the way, uh, uh, two of the largest uh, uh, country, uh, two of the largest sources of tourism for Sri Lanka, just as an aside, we'll get to this in a minute, are Ukraine and Russia, particularly Russia. So Russians used to love to go to Sri Lanka for vacation. Um, it is, of course, warm. It's tropical. It's it's a beautiful place, and uh, and if you, you you have a little bit of money. Uh, it is a great place to vacation and probably uh, not as expensive as many other places around the world. So uh, tourism, a major factor in the Sri Lankan economy. And then two things happened that destroyed the tourist industry for Sri Lanka. One, in 2019, I don't know if you guys remember this, but there was a massive terrorist attack in Sri Lanka. 230-something people were killed, were murdered by Islamists, suicide bombers, 
Um, there is a small group of Islamists, uh, of Muslims uh, living in Sri Lanka, relatively small. It's called the Easter Attack. Relatively small group, but, with, uh, but had been radicalized quite a bit. Uh, with Saudi money, like everybody is ra radicalized, right? And um, uh, some of those radical Islamists, um, uh, I can't remember how many, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, suicide bombers, but they went in and they targeted the tourist industries. They targeted hotels. So as a consequence of the terrorist bombing, tourism plummeted in 2019. It was starting to recover towards the end of the year and into 2020 when COVID happened. And of course, COVID basically drove tourism to zero or close to zero in Sri Lanka, which devastated the Sri Lankan economy. So you have a major source of revenue, a major source of foreign exchange, a major source of livelihood for Sri Lankans, devastated by uh, by the coronavirus, by COVID, and by, by the restrictions on travel, um, by the restrictions on travel. And as a consequence, uh, <laughs> and as a consequence, uh, Sri Lanka was starting to get into trouble in terms of uh, could it pay its debt. There was some talk about maybe Sri Lanka should default, but the Sri Lankans decided they would not and they started prioritizing debt payments on their massive, I think, $50 billion of debt uh, over imports and over, uh, you know, the things, uh, the things uh, uh, they needed. This, uh, of course, created a massive decline in standard of living and quality of life and, and problems in the Sri Lankan economy just accumulated and built and got worse. You could argue that, uh, you know, it has been argued, of course, that then uh, with the Russia invasion of Ukraine, gas prices going through the roof, uh, or food prices, particularly uh, things like wheat going through the roof, that that was kind of the tipping point that tipped it. Uh, Sri Lanka could not afford to import the gasoline. It imports all its, uh, all its gas. Uh, it imports a lot of food, uh, things like wheat. It, it has a, a, a robust agriculture, but it's not the kind of not the kind of country that produces wheat. It primarily produces uh, rice and, um, and and vegetables, and as I said, tea and rubber. So you suddenly got a spike in prices, and uh, all its foreign reserves were being spent on buying buying produce, buying gasoline, but mostly paying off its debt. Pay, paying interest on its debt, not even paying off its debt, paying interest on the debt. All right, so all of this is happening, um, which is uh, pretty devastating and pretty horrific to the economy um, and, uh, and it, you know, declining quality of life, declining standard of living. Applejack, thank you, really appreciate it. And then last year, in April last year, they kind of topped this off with one of the dumbest policy decisions you know in human in history it, it's just just unbelievable right so this is this is what they do now uh, it depends on your interpretation right it depends on your interpretation why they did it two possible reasons I'll get to but basically in April last year the president announced, that they were banning the importation of chemical fertilizer into uh, Sri Lanka. They were banning all chemical fertilizer. Now, just to be clear, two-thirds or, or more than two-thirds of the island's farmers, I think it was, sorry, 80% of the uh, 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 island's farmers were using chemical fertilizers. 80 to 90% of its tea farmers and rubber farmers were using chemical fertilizers. And suddenly, overnight, it became illegal to use such fertilizers. Now, why? Well, you could argue there are two reasons. One, 
the public reason, the reason the president gave, and second, maybe a hidden reason. Um, so the public reason was environment. Chemical fertilizers are bad for the environment. They pollute the rivers. And health. Chemical fertilizers make the food bad. This move was an attempt, according to the president, to convert Sri Lanka into the first country maybe in the world that is 100% organic. This was presented to the world, to Sri Lanka, is this massive attempt to make Sri Lanka's healthier, cleaner, and of course, it also helps with climate change because fertilizer is you know, based on a chemical process that produces CO2. So in this, a massive attempt to, on, in one day, to convert the entire country to organic farming, in one day, Now note that organic farming is hard, it's labor intensive. To, to actually do it at scale is super uh, um, knowledge intensive. That knowledge did not exist among the farmers. Maybe some farmers, 10%, 20% of them. There was no organic fertilizer to replace the chemical fertilizer that the president could offer in its stead. And basically what happened is that the farming industry in Sri Lanka collapsed. A third of all agricultural land went unplanted in the summer of 2021. A third. Crop yields from the areas the were planted dropped by 40%. 40%. And there you get a food shortage. And there you become dependent on Ukraine, on Russia for grain. I mean, Sri Lanka should be an exporter of food. It is an exporter of food. It was exporting rice. Now it can't make enough rice for its own people. All in the name of organic farming, all in the name of environmentalism. And this was, you know, a, a, a big priority and a big pitch to the world. Sri Lanka presented itself as this virtuous country. It was hailed by places like the World Economic Forum, by, you know, Nobel Prize winner Joseph Stiglitz, as this is amazing. This is terrific. This is what the whole world should be doing. I mean, this is as stupid as Germany going off of nuclear power and switching to wind and solar very, very fast. But in some sense, this was faster and dumber. But all in the same, in the name of some kind of amazing, you know, virtue they're going to become the world standard. This is more of the environmentalists destruction of human life, environmentalist destruction of living standards of, of life because people, are, people don't have food. There's not enough food. All in the name of organic, go organic. Now organic, organic agriculture, and I'll get to the other reason why uh, the Sri Lanka government probably did this, we'll get to that in a minute, but at least they present it to the world as the reason for this was environmentalism, going green, health. <sighs> Truly sad, though. Right? But it's interesting, right? That one thing we know is that organic farming uh, produces dramatically lower yields, as we saw in Sri Lanka, about 40% lower, even when it's done well. And in Sri Lanka, it was probably done not as well as it could have been. Right? 
So what you need is in order to grow the same amount of food, you have to go out in a much vaster area. So first, organic farming is lower yield. To grow the same amount of food, you have to so-called, quote, destroy a whole section of the environment in order to plant more. Ultimately, it turns out that in terms of CO2, in terms of, you know, whatever you want to call it, in terms of the uh, environmentalist stuff, organic farming is no more so-called clean than is chemical farming. Chemical farming is just unbelievably productive. It's much cheaper using chemical fertilizers, sorry. All right, another reason, another important reason why Sri Lanka switched to organic was that all of its chemical fertilizer were imported. And it was running out of money to buy stuff. So at least one reason, and maybe ultimately the dominant reason, why Sri Lanka dropped fertilizers was they couldn't afford to buy them anymore. And they couldn't afford to buy them anymore because they had bankrupted their own country. They had borrowed without thinking about tomorrow. They had built up a pyramid of debt, layering on top of layering it. They had created an economy that was built in corruption and on debt. Projects, infrastructure projects were built, which had no ability to return, to provide a return on investment. Sri Lanka was already a failed state. But this idea of going, going um, organic was the thing that tipped it into starvation. They stopped producing food. Now think about it. The two... Number one exports in Sri Lanka were tea and rubber. Exports in tea and rubber plummeted because they weren't producing enough. That made the foreign exchange problem worse because there was no income. And now how are they going to pay that debt? So as I said, in June, Sri Lanka defaulted on its first debt payment. It's going to have to restructure its debt. The, uh, uh, the IMF is involved. They'll have to restructure the economy. Quality of life, standard of living is going to drop precipitously. Um, it's going to go through a, a bunch of economic crises and political crises. This is going to be ugly. And this is the consequence of a combination of irrational environmentalist policy with irrational borrowing of money. See, I want for a minute just to ex expand beyond Sri Lanka. I mean, I don't know what's going to happen in Sri Lanka. It's a mess. It's a disaster. People are going to suffer. Um, and and, and I, I feel sorry for the people there. Uh, people are going to try to leave. I think you can expect a migration out. The question is, where do they go? Uh, maybe as a British colony, they'll try to go to, uh, to the UK. As a former British colony, they'll try to go to the UK. But uh, you can expect a, a decade now of real problems in Sri Lanka and, and a, a, horrific, a horrific economy. Now, uh, Sri Lanka has reversed... The organic plan, uh, they first eliminated uh, the ban on importing chemical fertilizers for the tea and rubber industry. Then they did it across the entire spectrum for all of it. The problem, of course, is now they don't have the foreign currency to import the fertilizer. So now they're stuck where they could import the fertilizer, but they can't. It's legal to import a fertilizer, but they don't have the money to do it. On top of that, uh, the government now, because of the outcry from the farmers, has committed $200, uh, $200 million to pay the farmers for losses due to the organic collapse, plus another 200 and something million dollars of subsidies, food subsidies, which will only put Sri Lanka in more debt, which is only going to make the collapse even more painful. I mean, there's just no way out of this. This is a disaster. It's a disaster caused by... Uh, the political class in Sri Lanka. It's a disaster caused by people who borrowed money with no regard 
uh, for tomorrow, no regard for their own people, uh, people who got rich off of the backs of their own people through, uh, through basically uh, bribery, fraud, corruption. So I feel sorry for the Sri Lankans. Unfortunately, this is probably not going to be the only country this is going to happen to. While I think this organic stupidity, irrationality, evil, uh, is unique with regard to Sri Lanka, I don't expect, I don't think other countries um, bought into this nonsense. But you're already seeing countries like Zambia, um, what was the other country? Uh, you know, other countries, uh, I, I think in Africa, you'll see other countries like uh, Sao Salvador in um, Central America, even though Sao Salvador is considered a libertarian because they went on Bitcoin, but Sao Salvador is in big trouble. Um, and I don't think the Bitcoin collapse is helping them. Uh, and you'll see other Latin American countries, uh, but certainly Zambia, uh, are, uh, in, in, in Zimbabwe, which has been in trouble for a long time, but is, these countries are in massive debt. There's no easy way for them to get out of the debt. They have not put together the policies that would get them out of debt in a healthy way. They are all on the verge of bankruptcy. Uh, other countries uh, could join that list. Ultimately, ultimately, Italy could be in trouble. Greece could be in trouble again, although Italy's probably in worse shape. Uh, Turkey goes in and out of trouble. Um, it, you know, other countries have massive amounts of debt uh, in Asia. Uh, even China is not in good shape economically, um, it, particularly, you know, given the consequences of COVID. Uh, and, of course, the United States is not in good shape. Uh, we have massive amounts of debt, uh, high inflation, not as high as, uh, uh, as Sri Lanka with 30 percent, but high inflation. And um, the world economy is in real trouble. This is, you know, what we're seeing right now. By the way, one of the things that Sri Lankan government did uh, when it couldn't raise debt anymore, right, when the debt was so high, is it started printing money. It started printing money like crazy, as governments like this do, because they're desperate. And they have to pay their bills locally. They can't get it in front of exchange, but they can at least do it locally. And as a consequence of paying it, uh, you know, printing all their money, what happened? Well, inflation. So uh, uh, global economy is in deep trouble. Uh, developing countries are in deep trouble. Countries that relied on debt to finance themselves are in deep trouble, partially because interest rates are so much higher, so the interest payments they're going to have to make in the future are so much higher, and the only way they can fund, the, they can pay the debt is by refinancing it, which raises the interest rate constantly in an inflationary environment. But also because, given... The bankruptcies, uh, given the defaults of places like Sri Lanka, debt is going to become more expensive, particularly in developing countries. It's going to become more and more expensive. You're going to see the global economy um, probably not shrink, but grow dramatically less than expected. Um, and uh, you will see significant, significant consequences, uh, significant consequences uh, around the world. Uh, these things always start in little countries in the middle of nowhere that nobody pays attention to and nobody seems to care about. And they tend to, they, they, those tend to be the canaries kind of in the coal mine. And then uh, given the debt burden, by the way, one of the big countries that is on the brink of uh, default, we'll see if they actually default or not default, is Pakistan. Pakistan is a massive country. Um, it is a country with a huge population and it is a country that is economically uh, again, on the verge of default, together with all these other countries. So you're, you're you know, uh, you're seeing significant decline. And of course, you know, think about what's happening in Ukraine. Think about the Russian economy. Think about the money that's going to have to be spent to rebuild Ukraine and to, and to ultimately uh, to rebuild the Russian economy. Where is that money going to come from? The world economy is heading towards. A, a, a very, very difficult decade, a very, very difficult decade, uh, again, with inflation, rising interest rates, recession, and uh, defaults in the periphery. Remember that the people who lent money to the, uh, these countries are people who live in relatively rich countries. This all hampers their wealth. It, it reduces the amount of wealth that they have. So this is bad news across the board.
All right, that's the spiel about Sri Lanka. I thought you'd be interested. It's going on right now. Thank you for listening or watching The Iran Brooks Show. If you'd like to support the show, we make it as easy as possible for you to trade with me. You get value from listening. You get value from watching. Show your appreciation. You can do that by going to iranbookshow.com support, by going to Patreon, subscribe star, locals, and just making a appropriate contribution uh, on any one, of those, uh, any one of those channels. Also, if you'd like to see the Iran Book Show grow, please consider sharing our content. And of course, subscribe. Press that little bell button right down there on YouTube so that you get an announcement when we go live. And for you, those of you who are already subscribers and those of you who are already supporters of the show, thank you. I very much appreciate it.